those outcomes that are set, set in uh, measurable indicators. And this is a topic that's been much more um, studied as well as implemented in other areas of human services than in child welfare. One of the things that we've discovered in looking at child states um, in their child welfare systems in terms of how their contracts are basically structured, there are a number of different ways that they vary. In tr it, it, that can involve financial variance, how uh, payments are made, what's rewarded or punished, and how that works, um, how information is collected from contractors, and also uh, financial risk. Because one of the things that a lot of states have found is the importance of sharing risk in some way between the public agency and the individual private providers. Because the provision of child welfare services uh, is, is such a um, high dollar, risky, difficult to anticipate area of work. Just, and Crystal, one second. Everyone should be able to log back on now and get the um, get the, uh, the webinar page. So we back on again. Yeah. Okay, so we should go, okay, back to the original email and the whole thing. Okay. okay. But just please continue. I, I think just others, could, if they want to log on, can do so. Okay. So um, we had done in, in 2009 a series of key informant um, interviews with child welfare directors across the country. And one of the things that we wanted to know at that time was how many states are using performance-based contracting. And uh, there is a slide in the PowerPoint, if you could see it, that would that provides a breakdown for those that said that they were using PBC and um, whether or not the state was linking a payment to performance in some way or another way that PBCs can be structured is having performance link to whether or not the contract would be renewed. So at the end of the year, that's where the hook is in terms of whether appropriate um, outcomes have been met. And at that time, we also asked who was doing this kind of work in in-home services, and Iowa and Nebraska were two states that said that they were. Now, alternatively, last year the, the QIC did a survey of private child and family serving agencies across the country. Um, we had almost 500 uh, agencies respond. And the vast majority of those agencies said that they were not being asked by the child welfare agency to use performance-based contracting. So it's still a growing field. Sharon, go ahead and um, move on. OK. So very quickly, there were just a few promising practices that we wanted to look at. Because many states that were doing this kind of work said that they believed that it was important. One, a shared vision. Two, inclusive planning involving providers as well as the public agency. Engaging exter external um, entities like the court um, or key service providers and in-home services. It may involve substance abuse providers or mental health providers, for example. OK, advance the slide, please. Thank you. Um, and looking at how do you do uh, systemic and case level review of uh, those agencies, of the providers, to determine whether or not they are achieving the goals of the, of the contract without micromanaging. The next piece of interest was how do you use a quality assurance system to be tracking outcomes and continually be improving the outcomes across providers by learning from each other what practice improvement they are making to achieve outcomes. And then finally, how do you manage a real partnership between the public and private providers? OK, go ahead to the next slide. We have three different demonstration sites. And I don't have time to go into the detail about each of them. You can see there on the slide that they varied in a number of different ways. We had a grantee in Florida, one in Missouri, and one in residential. I mean, I'm sorry, one in Illinois. Illinois' project involved performance-based contracting and residential services, and the other two involved foster care case management services. They differed in the terms of the type of uh, 
performance measures that they used and that they uh, had tied to fiscal uh, consequences. And they also differed in size. Illinois was a statewide project, and the other two had specific regions that were involved. We did use a quasi-experimental design to try to get a sense of improvement comparatively. So go ahead and advance. And if you're interested in any of that, the materials that I sent out have a lot of detail on each of those projects and what we learned. This slide just goes over the research questions that we were looking at. I just am going to focus on a couple of them because I think they're so important. One of the pieces that we found was so critical was that inclusive and comprehensive planning process. Um, and it was very important that that planning not take place just in the, in the public agency, but be a collaborative process with potential providers. And another piece was figuring out what those necessary components are that need to be built into the overall system to support the PBC. And that's going to be a lot of the focus of what I'm going to talk about today. Go ahead to the next slide. Just to give you the, the cut to the chase on, on our overall outcomes, we did see performance improvement in all three of our sites with the use of the performance-based um, contracts, including when we standardized the, the data across the three sites to show um, positive change. Go ahead to the next slide. So these are the things that we found were important elements to uh, launching and maintaining a, a performance-based contracting system across providers uh, within a system. The first piece had to do with it being the right time for this to happen. Um, oftentimes, Things like this come to the table in the midst of a political crisis. And in, in some states uh, that we worked with, that was the case. But this idea of having the, the state really having the, the right constellation of factors to make it happen, and also having leaders in both the public and private sector actively involved in the work throughout the entire implementation. I've already mentioned the planning process, and I do want to mention having sufficient time to plan. Two of our projects took basically a year to plan how they were going to implement the PVC to select their performance indicators, to make sure that they had the, way, the ability to measure those indicators to, to develop their system for looking at data over time. One project did it in only four months um, and then had to do some fairly significant um, work as they were implementing to make that work out. So time is important. Having a formalized and transparent communication structure, and this is true in terms of public-private partnership in general, uh, having some sort of formalized uh, infrastructure where that happens, where feedback is coming to both the, ma the, um, the macro and the micro levels, down, all the way down to the practice uh, level. Obviously, your data system um, is very important. And having a restructuring your quality improvement system to look at those indicators that are being tracked and rewarded in the, in the PVC. Um, the final thing that I want to mention on this is that states often call me and say, will you just tell me what outcomes we should be putting into our performance-based contracts? And the answer to that is there is no cookbook recipe for that. It really depends on what your state is trying to achieve, the kind of data that you're able to track, where you're most interested in emphasizing, because what gets measured is and rewarded is what's going to be focused on. And so it's really that process of determining the, the uh, indicators you're going to use and building that contract around it. Next slide. This has a lot of information on it, but I just want to, um, and I don't have time, as much time as I would have hoped to talk about some examples from each of these three states. But each of the states built site-specific support in their system to try to promote success in the PVC. Uh, that had to do with the way that they uh, managed their collaboration, the kind of regular meetings that they had, the infrastructure that they built. Um, the tools that they used in terms of tracking outcomes 
as well as supporting practice like a in residential, they needed to develop an entire protocol for discharging kids from residential and stepping them down into the community. Decision-making support, a formalized way for the partnership together to make decisions. Ultimately, the public agency is you know, in charge if it's a mandated public service. But having a process where those decisions are uh, considered and supported is important. I've already mentioned the data and um, also setting up specific systems to align the, the QAQI system. And the information that you have in your handout go into detail related to a number of these different suggestions or these different examples of how we build that. Okay, next slide. So lessons learned. I've already emphasized a lot this collaboration and communication, and everybody always feels like we talk about that too much because it seems so obvious, but it really is so incredibly important that there be an established infrastructure for that and a way to work through and troubleshoot the problems that you're going to have. Um, in a couple of our projects, they had significant issues in their data systems at different times or in the way that they were tracking their outcomes. And since money was tied to it, they had to figure out a way to, another way to go, by, go about that measurement and troubleshoot the problems they were having. So it's especially important. Using lessons learned for, as you're phasing in, a lot of states will decide we're going to phase this in across contracts. So we're going to maybe start with this one, one contract and set of providers and move it on. So having a systematic way of, of building those lessons learned in. I've mentioned the partnership. I, I think we need to recognize that this is, an, this is reform on both the public and the private side. Um, it's easy to think that it's the providers that need to adjust to a, TV, to a PBC, but what we found was each of the public agencies had a lot of work that they had to do in order to make their own system function within this new process. Selection of the right outcomes for the state and for the service is really important, and being willing to tweak that. In our states, over the three years of implementation, they had to make some changes in those uh, as they had some experience in, in measuring and tracking them. Really important to have your finance people at the table right from the beginning um, in figuring out how are we going to uh, measure these outcomes and what's a realistic way for us to tie these fiscal incentives or disincentives to it? Um, and then I think just to reemphasize the, the data collection and the tracking system being so important, I think it's really very important when states are able to share data across providers so that everyone is looking at um, how the system is performing as a whole and is able to learn from those providers that are doing really well in performance and improvement so that we can, as a system, improve. Okay, next slide. And this, this really is just kind of summarizing, so in the interest of time, I'm going to stop. And uh, I'm sorry for being so rushed, but I'm going to toss it over mm -hmm. to Iowa. Okay, Mindy? Oh, Mindy, you have to start fix your phone if you're there. Start fix your phone so you can talk. All right, this is Mindy. Can you hear me? Thank you, Mindy. <laughs> okay, well, I will do as quick of a presentation as possible as we talk about performance-based contracting here in Iowa. One of the questions asked was, why was it that Iowa went to performance-based contracting? Well, in June of 2001, Iowa passed the Accountable Government Act, which is basically it was signed into law by our governor at the time that identified a results-oriented government system that was basically included in this AGA that has basically told us how we're going to start to do business today. Within that AGA, it talks about performance-based contracting and some of the specific contract clauses, which we identified um, as performance measures, monitoring clauses, review clauses, as well as payment clauses. Okay, next slide. Just some general information about the Iowa Department of Human Services is that we currently have over 1,500 service contracts 
each of those contracts are actually written in the PBC method regardless of that dollar amount. So even a lot of our smaller dollar amount contracts up to our multi-million dollar contracts are written in this PBC method. We do not have a central unit of individuals who actually write the proposals and the contracts. What we've identified is, is that we do have some policy and program staff here at our Department of Human Services central office who does a lot of the child welfare contract writing, but we also do have several staff within the field and the local areas that do a lot of the smaller contracting with the writing of the RFPs as well as drafting of the contracts. So basically, um, we just we don't have anyone that's really specialized to do so. So we do have um, several different individuals that are working in that process. Next slide. The other thing that Iowa does is that we utilize what we call a hot doc software, which is a contract creator. We know it normally and basically really call it the C2. And what this does is it's a document assembly program and basically it kind of walks individuals through it asks questions and what it does is it takes all the information that has been entered and compiles it into the actual format for the specific document that you're looking for. And it actually keeps everything consistent and up to date across the state, across all contracts, whether it's those small dollars to those multi-million dollar contracts. Basically one of the things that this is presented as is our C2 is basically our TurboTax, it's our TurboTax for service contracts. Kind of that easy system that really does help guide the individuals going through that particular program. The Office of Auditor of State performs an annual audit of at least 25 service contracts to the department, and several of the AGA requirements are compared to that documentation in each of those 25 files that are, that are pulled. Not only do we have the state auditor perform audits, we also do internal audits as well. What we did find out, and this is the first time since the review started, was that in fiscal year 2011, we actually had no adverse findings upon our state auditor results. Next slide. Oh, sorry, you're already there. Um, as it came to the actual performance-based contracting, our very first child welfare service contract was what we called community care. This was actually rolled out in 2005. The contract date began February 1 of 2005. And what community care was, it's it's a program that is offered to families after the completion of a child protective assessment who do not meet DHS eligibility or that um, maintain continued need for the department support. Um, let's see, what else? Once we went to the community care piece of it, we then looked at the following year in our recruitment and retention of resource families. That was our next performance-based contract. And then ultimately in 2007, we rolled out our safety plan and our family safety risk and permanency services. And the 2007, we did a major shift in delinking from RTSS and Medicaid, and that's when we shifted our entire focus of our child welfare family-centered services. So as Crystal mentioned, Iowa was one of the states that do reference in-home services, which is part of the performance-based contracting. The in-home service, the out-of-home placement, all these services are facilitated through the um, Family Safety Risk and Permanency Services. Each of these contracts that are listed here actually align with our Child and Family Services Review as well as the Iowa Department um, of Human Services Model of Practice. Okay, next slide. In following along with the timeline from when the AGA was signed to the rollout of our first PBC contracts, um, in 2010, we actually had Senate File 2088, which was signed into law that basically, in part, required state employees who conduct bids for services to receive training on an annual basis about procurement rules and regulations and procurement best practices. Based upon that, six courses were actually specifically identified that all Department of Human Service staff need to take if they write or procure contracts. And of those, the courses include service procurement and template, contract creator and our PCQ, which is our pre-contract questionnaire. The PCQ is actually a budget payment coding that we use. The third training offered is scope of work basics regarding deliverable performance measures, monitoring and reviewing. The fourth is contract terms and conditions. 
The fifth is the RFP development and the RFP template overview. And the sixth course offered is the monitoring and review activities. So aside from those six courses that all staff need to take that handle or write procurement, aside from those six initial courses, then every year thereafter, they're required to take refresher courses at least one time per year to continue to um, stay within the, 20, um, the Senate File 2088 requirement. Okay, next slide. As we saw in 2005, that was the rollout, our very first procurement of our performance-based contracting. Well, in 2009, we had to re-procure our community care contract. What we had learned from this was that in 2005, when we rolled this out, we had done a lot of this decision-making based upon solely department, public, internal staff. As we began to learn, as Crystal mentioned, our lessons learned, you kind of build upon that as you go through the next contracts that you're identifying and procuring. We learned some of that information from a lot of this building up of the recruitment and retention to the family safety risk and permanency back into community care. And then in 2011, we actually reprocured the safety plan services and the FSRP services again because what we had learned, and I know I'm kind of skipping around here on the lessons learned, is when we initially did our performance-based contracting for safety plan and FSRP services, we did not write the contract length of term to accommodate the requirements of the performance measures that were 6, 12, and 18, 24 months out. So what we had to do was re-procure that early and amend our initial contracts because the last two years of the contract were solely specifically for payment of those performance measures. So that was one of the major lessons learned that we had done here in Iowa. Along with our re-procurements, in 2011, we had our very first round of procurements for our foster group care, our child welfare emergency services. Recruitment and retention was once again a re-procurement. A new procurement was the supervised apartment living, and we also procured the Iowa Foster Care Youth Council. Again, with all of these contracts, uh, performance measures also align with our CFSR and our model of practice. Okay, next slide. Some of the strengths that we identified as a state as it relates to performance-based contracting is, of course, it focuses on the outcomes. It, it kind of takes it away from the process and the rules and really puts that emphasis on quality and results. It also helps us identify a clear set of objectives and indicators. And one of the things that we also learned from pulling in our contractors and our public and private side partnerships is that it really encourages our contractors to take steps to meet or exceed those expected um, performance measures. And it also allows us to better assess contract effect, effectiveness so that we can kind of gather information from them as we continue to look at modifying, amending our contracts as it relates to making sure that we're getting to the needs of the services of children and families here in Iowa. It also allows for a collection of data on the performance indicators, and it really did help improve our public-private partnerships. It really encouraged that collaboration piece of it. Um, let's see. We can go on to the next slide. Some of the challenges that we identified is, I think Crystal had mentioned this as well, is that some of the practice changes for both DHS and our provider staff. Because one of the things is, even though we had the ATA in 2001, we really never did have discussions about what performance-based contracting was really about until we started to roll out these contracts. So trying to educate both the DHS, our public side, as well as our private staff to actually understand what performance-based contracting was all about we all needed to kind of learn that in order for us to be able to educate and share that information down to our frontline staff. One of the other things of one of the challenges is getting that buy-in at all levels, especially in that management and that frontline staff level. Next slide. Lessons learned. I had a lot of lessons learned from 2005 to even up until 2011. One of the things that we cannot stress enough is that you really need to plan. Um, the other piece of it is really communicate, be flexible, allow a lot of time for that procurement process to take place, and engage your private partners and your external stakeholders early in the process. Hold public forums, meetings, have those conversations that you can, you know, you can solicit some feedback and get some ideas from. And one of the other things, and I know a lot of this stuff may not necessarily be specific to performance-based contracting, but to all contracting in general, is, is just make sure you hold to that timeline that you set forth in the RFP. Next slide. 
In actual development of the RFP, one of the things that we learned was that we really want to make sure that you're not, we're not duped. We had several RFPs where you would read a section and then you would go to another section and it sounded very familiar because the fact was is that we seemed to repeat ourselves. So what we really want to make sure is that we're being very clear on what those contractor expectations are and we don't want to duplicate that throughout the different sections. We want to be very clearly stated within that scope of work what it is, what is the outcome that we want to achieve, and then we ask that you as providers, when they submit their proposals, to actually tell us how they're going to do it. Um, ensure that the performance measures actually get to the desired outcomes to which you achieve. This may mean during the course of your time that you have your contract that you may need to revisit this upon the next, the next procurement or you may need to look at identifying potential amendments. In one of our um, RFP releases, once we signed contracts, we actually did about, I don't know, 8 to 12 contract amendments probably within the first five months of that initial contract that we had because of all the things that we had kind of learned from what we may or may not have done so fully in the beginning. And we all, one of the things we also learned was that not all of our contract requirements really need to be monitored and tracked. Okay, next one. In the release of the RFP, allow enough time in the Q&A to incorporate the answers. One of the things that we strongly encourage from our lessons learned is that there will always be amendments no matter how much of a well-written RFP you think you have, there will be amendments. And what you want to make sure you're doing is allowing enough time to be able to provide those clarifications within the Q&A in that timeline. And then each and every time you do an amendment, make sure you're putting it in one single document so that when the actual amendments are all said and done of that RFP, you have one document that has the multiple amendments in it so that you know what actual proposal RFP that you're actually working from. Make sure you know you limit proposal length. Again, that's not necessarily performance-based solely, but we want to make sure when we were actually soliciting bid proposals that we wanted to make sure we limited the amount of time. We wanted them to be very clear as to how they're going to meet the objectives and the performance goals that we set forth in our contracts in the RFP. And one of the things that we have also learned is that we want to make sure that when we do contracts in the future, we want to make sure that we are requiring our bidders to number or file the actual scoring tool identified because that is the base which we evaluate and determine whether or not we're going to award a letter of intent to contract with those individuals or those agencies. Okay, next slide. As I said, expect amendments, especially during that initial contract, if it's the very first one that you rolled out. You want to make sure that you're documenting, monitoring, and review. One of the things that the Iowa performance-based contracting really tries to avoid is outputs, which are those fees for services which often do not equate to those outcomes. For example, we really need examples because I think a lot of times outputs, outcomes, a lot of people can't quite make that distinction as to what is the difference between the two. So for an example, an output example would be for family team decision making. Contractors shall facilitate 10 family team decision making meetings each month. That's an output. What we need to do is word that in a sense that we're identifying what is the actual outcome is that we want to see. So the outcome example that we would offer is no reabuse in 95% of all families that participate in contractor facilitated family team decision making meetings. So there's a difference there between that output, which is that number, and then the outcome, which is actually achieving what we want. We don't want reabuse in 95% of those families. Another example would be that output of the number of high school graduates, where the outcome actually is what is the percent of high school graduates. One of the other um, lessons learned is that we want to make sure that we're focusing on incentives versus disincentives. And one of the key things that we also need to ensure is that make sure that your IT department can actually produce the data elements that are required to gather that information to determine how it is that contractors are performing across those performance measures. Make sure that you're aware of that information prior to putting it in the contract or within that RFP. So I think that was the last of my slides. Yep. <laughs> that would be it. So that's all I really have to say for this. So thank you, Mindy and Crystal. Um, again, I want to apologize to everyone who was on the phone earlier when we heard the the, the music. Mm -hmm. um, uh, unfortunately, we can never predict what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, but Gia, if you're there, you can start fix your phone, and I'm sure you have a couple of questions you want to ask our presenters to start us off. 
thanks, I do. Um, one of the things that was very striking to, to me about what was presented for Iowa is that you had um, a statutory mandate in place, and to me that's a great equalizer among the different opinions about whether or not it's time to go forward with performance-based contracting. So I was wondering, Crystal, in the your experience with states, how did that play out among other states? Was there already some type of legislative mandate that preceded the deployment of performance-based contracting? Most of the states that have gone to performance-based contracting have not, in our experience that we've worked with, have not gone that in that direction based on a legislative mandate. Oftentimes, though, the, the outsourcing of services to the private sector happens with a mandate, but I am I don't think most examples that I know about are legislatively mandated. When that happens, um, similar to if you think about what happened, uh, you know, when uh, a lot of sort, a lot of services were outsourced uh, in in um, states like uh, Nebraska recently and others. Oftentimes, the time frame for getting that work done is very fast and it can impede the planning that we've found to be so much so important. Did that answer your question, Sharon? It did. Okay. Also, um, Mindy, you talked about planning, which is just, you know, I think it's a word that, that we can't use enough when we talk about the delivery of services for um, the populations that we serve, and you mentioned that you held stakeholder meetings. I'm interested and think it, it might be beneficial to, to others to hear a little bit about what the providers were most concerned about in the early phases of that transition. I think some of the most themes that we often thought of amongst those transition pieces were is that shared accountability, that shared responsibility. Because for all the years prior to, it was always the Department of Human Services telling our providers what it is that they need to do to serve the children and families in Iowa. Upon having this conversation when we were looking at um, changing the way we do our family center child welfare services, that seemed to be a lot of the concern is because we went from, I want to say around 150 individual provider agencies to the first year of our child's family centered one in 2007 with FSRP went down to 11 agencies that provided services across the entire state based upon certain contract areas. So going from that magnitude of, of being kind of given that specific direction to now all of a sudden be handing this a large amount of flexibility as it related to achieving the outcomes, we're not going to tell you how to get there. We want you to get them there because this is what we want to see. So that was the biggest thing, is that responsibility, that shared ownership, um, the accountability. Those were a lot of the biggest concerns that we've heard through all of this process with all of the different particular program areas. And, and one last question or follow-up question uh, to that for you is, have you been able to evaluate the results from the time that you started to now? Are we able to kind of glean from it any benefits that you see to your organization since the performance-based contracting began? I would say yes. I think that's kind of across all program levels in the sense of, as we talked about, becoming that performance-based piece of it, it kind of puts those contractors, our providers, in more of an ownership role where they know that they're trying to assist those families to get the outcomes in order for them to be prepared that incentive piece as it relates to that pay for performance. And so basically upon them taking ownership and being more of that team, we seem to have been able to develop stronger teams and capacity to be able to provide services. We've had a lot of um, comments from contractors that say in the past they used to compete with one another, but now they're working for one another. They're helping each other. They're doing a lot more of a collaborative effort within the private sector themselves to kind of say what we're doing well in this area, how we can kind of continue that across the way. And that's kind of picked up with the public side as well as with the department, seeing that we are partners and that we all have the same goal in mind as it relates to the children and families here in Iowa. And so therefore, we've seen a lot of the performance measures from maybe the initial program to 
the most recent procurements, we have seen an increase in the number of percentages for performance measures. We've seen an increase um, in in a lot of our data, and I'm going to look at Kara for some of this, but, you know, we have had, because it's performance-based, we have seen some changes within our uh, re-abuse, within our um, adjudication, within our uh, reunification. A lot of our CFSR outcomes, we do have a lot of benefits pulled into that that I'm hoping as we continue to fine-tune performance-based contracting and make sure that we are getting to those outcomes that we've identified, that that continues to see progression forward and increase in, in, in percentages in our state's performance. Great. Thank you, Mindy. Um, if we have any participants on the phone that also have questions or comments or want to share what they're doing, um, you can start fix your phone now and ask our presenters questions or just give comments or share what's going on in your state. Start fix your phone. This is Cosette from Utah. Hey, Cosette. Um, I wanted to see if they could give us some examples of how they paid these contractors. How did they do the incentive payment? Um, yeah, just give us a feel for how the whole payment piece of it worked. Also, um, would it be possible to, pos to get copies of contracts, maybe by contacting individual state contact people that were listed? Um, this is Mindy. Yeah, if, if there's examples of things that you want, just let us know here, and we will make sure that we can kind of pull that together. As it relates for our pay, the payment piece of it is um, a few of the programs that we have have like a, they're provided a monthly a, a monthly base rate, so they get a base rate regardless of um, contacts, the number of contacts, number of families served. But then on top of that, they get that ability to earn that performance pay. In some of the contracts, it's per family. Um, a lot of our performance measures are also paid based on per child. Um, we've also got in one or two of the uh, different contracts that we have, we also do a payment for satisfaction as it relates to how are our families served, are they satisfied with services received and how that looks. Um, but a lot of those um, different payment mechanisms, the base pay versus the ability to earn incentive pay for performance, we can get those examples to you um, that would kind of give you a better explanation as to how it's formulated and what it is that we're looking at as it relates to some of those. That so would be great. Yeah, and if, you know, and you can email the questions to me. I think my email address is up there. But if there's a certain program area that you're really more focused in, whether or not you want to look at the recruitment and retention of foster families, if you're looking at more of the group care piece or our family center child welfare, just kind of shoot me a note and let me know what kind of program areas that you're most interested in, and I can kind of shoot those out to you. Are there any other questions, any comments? Any other want to share what's going on in your state? in regards to performance-based contractors? Tia, do you have uh, one more question? And uh, then we're going to have to end, unfortunately. <laughs> I would um, like to find out from Iowa from, I guess, sort of the inception of the idea and to when you actually rolled out your first contract to providers, what did your timeline look like? Can you maybe ask that question again? I'm trying to process. <laughs> How long did it take you, Mindy, from the time that you decided to begin performance-based contracting to the actual rollout of the first cycle of those contracts? What was your timeline? <laughs> well, our initial one back in 2005 I don't think was quite uh, realistic. But over the course of the time, what we're looking at is more like an 18 to 24-month time frame. Because whenever we identify when it is that we want to roll those contracts out, we kind of work backwards on our timeline to determine when it is that we need to release that RFP. And one of the biggest things that we learned is making sure that once you release that RFP that you do allow enough time for questions because it may kind of change in some of the scope of direction that you may intend to take those services. Um, I do know that when we rolled out in 2007 for safety plan and FSRP services, we were scheduled to roll out for July 1 but we actually weren't able to do it until the following, until that October. And then in that time, we weren't even able to identify contracts for all the entire service areas that we have. And so one, we rolled out in October, and then the last service area didn't roll out until January. So we were still kind of working on those timelines. But the most recent ones that we felt really worked well were anywhere between 18 and 22 months back. 
Okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, we run, have run out of time, and I truly a thank you, Crystal, Mindy, and Dia, for um, leading the discussion and sharing uh, what's going on out there in the field in regards to performance-based contracting. Again, I want to apologize for earlier um, noise and disturbance, but um, I, again, we would like to hear from you all, and uh, we, we really want to hear your feedback. So I put up on the screen the uh, Survey Monkey that you can go to to um, uh, provide feedback, whether it's we got into today's web um, teleconference or also to give us some suggestions for um, next year's, because um, we're starting back up again in December is our next one. And so we want to know what, what topics are interesting to you uh, as well as we plan out the next fiscal year. So uh, again, I want to thank you. Are there any other questions, any other comments before we end the call today? Okay. If not, uh, again, thank you all for being on the call, and you all have a wonderful day. Okay. Bye. The host has left meeting. So at this time, the meeting will come to an end. Thank you. Goodbye.